Are we ready? Okay. Okay. Are you sure we shouldn't just all gather around my laptop? Okay. Wave your arms around that. Express yourself. Okay, you lost. Okay. Well, thank you very much, the, the few of you, you that are here, for taking the time to listen to what I have to say. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here and sort of spread the word for a project that I'm working on. Uh, the, uh, the main question, sort of, that, uh, that led up to this project is. Basically, where's the vision? Uh, and in Northeast Ohio, I think a lot of times we're lacking it. And um, this, was, this is sort of uh, a project going on that's hopefully going to answer it. Uh, one of the problems is vision's kind of a loaded word. It always kind of implies visionaries and new cutting edge ideas. Uh, I prefer to think about it as uh, vision coming from individuals who see opportunities staring them in the face. And I have a feeling there are probably a lot of people at this conference uh, who see things staring them in the face. Um, and a lot of times vision involves things that are accessible and familiar, not necessarily exotic. Um, and so the question is, what, what are the opportunities that are staring us in the face? And uh, I'm specifically going to talk about one opportunity, which in Northeast Ohio uh, involves building an economy around design. And I'm going to specifically talk about product design uh, because my, my background is product design. Uh, I teach at the Cleveland Institute of Art. I run the industrial design program. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm working on a project in collaboration with Cleveland State University, Cleveland Institute of Art, and the Civic Innovation Lab. And, uh, and the project is called the District of Design. And kind of an overview of the current situation in North e Northeast Ohio is uh, that the region is home to more than 40 consumer product brands, some of them recognized worldwide. That Northeast Ohio is uh, what Ned Hill at Cleveland State, my partner in the project, referred to as a, a nebula of consumer product development capacity, but as a whole, it's less than the sum of the parts. The uh, consumer product Marketing and manufacturing industry relies on design to connect with its consumer, create brand experiences, and add value. And that we know part of the current situation is that Northeast Ohio lacks a vibrant design culture that enables companies to attract and retain top talent. And we believe that in order to foster global competitiveness, we need to leverage the regional expertise that we have in consumer product design, R&D, marketing, manufacturing, sales, and distribution. And that ultimately the goal of the project that we're working on is what we refer to uh, as the, the, creating the Milan of the Midwest and establishing Cleveland and Northeast Ohio as the capital of consumer product development in the U.S. And this, this goes back to uh, sort of staring, staring, uh, staring at things that uh, you know, are right in front of you, the assets that we have, history. Um, Victor Schreckengast is part of the legacy of consumer product development in the, in the region, and he was a professor at the Cleveland Institute of Art. He was considered, uh, he started what is considered to be the first industrial design program in the country, and he's credited with having a $250 billion impact on the U.S. economy. Another asset that we have is talent. The program that I run is considered one of the best in the U.S. And, and, and at CIA, we train some of the most sought after talent in, in the industry. Uh, another asset we have is region, regional expertise. Uh, I mentioned there are over 40 consumer product brands. Just of the companies on this list, Craftmade is actually the largest cabinet manufacturer in the world. American Greetings is considered to have the largest creative studio in the world. So there's quite a bit of, uh, there are quite a bit of resources here relating to this kind of work. The current climate for design, 
uh, consumers are paying for better design. And uh, a lot of companies are finally uh, investing in design uh, because the demand is there. And then also, uh, it's, it's been a long time in coming, but uh, there are certain organizations that are actually starting to track when companies use design well and invest in design, uh, they're, they're actually starting to track performance, stock market performance, things like that. And uh, the Design Council UK actually tracks uh, the FTSE performance for companies that use design well and those that don't. And uh, the companies that use design well outperform those that don't by, by 200%. So underlying the idea of the Milan of the Midwest is creating a design and innovation culture. And that involves a number of things. One of them is improving design and innovation management through collaborative higher education programs. It's one of the reasons why we're working with Cleveland State and we also work with CASE. Uh, we're talking about Ra uh, raising regional awareness through a design and innovation prize. And we're looking at tapping into regional talent and becoming more connected with K through 12 education to develop design and innovation programs. And then also the last piece of the puzzle was sort of to create an identifiable heart of the design community. We're calling that the district of design. And that's uh, of the four things that we went into this looking at. The last one was sort of the the, uh, has become the focal point, has gained a lot of momentum. So what is the district? Um, the, the, uh, the, the concept is modeled after uh, a place in Chicago called the Merchandise Mart. It's basically a, uh, uh, a place with permanent showrooms for companies all over the world to display their products. Uh, what we're talking about is taking that same concept and putting it on the street level, storefronts, and creating sort of a vibrant street life, uh, really kind of, again, built around regional assets. Uh, the, the, way that the, the way that this would work is um, in, in consumer product development and, and, and the retail business, there are retail buyers, like for Target or uh, Ace Hardware, uh, that they travel around the country or the world looking for their product line. Um, so what we're talking about here are showrooms where they could come into town, plan their product line, um, see what the company produces and what's available, and make purchases. And they purchase in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, not the ones and twos. Uh, the, uh, the area that we're talking about for the District of Design, it's... Um, it uh, starts in the south around Prospect, moves up towards St. Clair, um, and then East 13th on the uh, western end and East 36th on the eastern end. And the, the core of it is sort of around Playhouse Square. That's where the showrooms would be. But we've included a lot of real estate for the purposes of growing design studios and um, manufacturing companies. Uh, it turns out that as we defined the, the geography of it, and we sort of had strategies to include live workspaces because designers like to live in live workspaces, uh, include media and Cleveland State and uh, larger industrial spaces. Uh, so as we laid it out and then started to survey what was already there, it turned out that in that district that we kind of randomly defined, uh, there were already a hundred design related companies employing 1,400 people. And and when I say design related, it's web design firms, graphic design, architecture, product design, uh, photography studios. Um, the, um, another reason for the location is as the Silver Line is being built down Euclid Avenue, it will connect Public Square with University Circle. And that's really kind of connecting the talent pool with, uh, between Cleveland State, Case, the Cleveland Institute of Art, so we're really kind of building this around the idea that we're going we're gonna to have students moving back and forth, professionals moving back and forth to, to uh, access the resources that the city has available. Uh, we're also, we're trying to make it as walkable as possible. So more than half of the district that we've defined is within a five minute walk of the new Silver Line, uh, which is actually scheduled to be finished in 2008. 
Um, and, and overall, what we're talking about in terms of an experience, I mentioned that there are buyers that come into town to, to buy consumer goods. Currently, the way it happens is a buyer may fly into, fly into the airport, drive for 45 minutes to um, various locations, Solon or uh, various locations around the region, kind of go into a exit an anonymous exit ramp, enter the back of a warehouse, and sort of plan their product line. We're trying to make it a much more high-end experience, create synergies among companies who are located in the district, and do things like create the District of Design marketplace where uh, maybe these showrooms open up to consumers and uh, you can see new things, buy new things, and, and companies can do consumer testing. Uh, the value of doing this, it uh, it's places an emphasis on existing strengths. Most of the pieces to do this are already here. Uh, we believe that it will foster a design and innovation culture which isn't just about creating new consumer products, it really is about uh, its politics, its medicine, it's anything where we need more innovative thinking. And we believe that this will make Northeast Ohio a talent magnet and, um, and establish the region uh, as, as, a, as a region that leads thought in design. And for companies, it results in top-line revenue growth, which companies want to hear. The status of the project, um, conversations about this project started about a year ago. And um, we really, uh, we did some groundwork and announced it about six months ago. And since in the last six months, uh, we've gotten a lot of buy-in from government officials, both city, state, uh, county and um, from institutions of higher learning, from businesses and CDCs. Had a, we've, uh, we're actually in the process of negotiating real estate, uh, a master lease agreement for uh, multiple property owners, and then understanding what financial incentives might be available to help with build out costs and, and rent. And then, um, and actually several companies have already declared their intent to be there. It really is just a matter of working out the nuts and bolts. And so the, the, the basic picture of the project is that um, we sort of turn some barren streets and, uh, uh, that lack any sort of vibrancy in life into uh, basically a commercial district. And uh, hopefully we start, like I said, with the ground level storefronts and then build, build design studios around it and the support structure needed, needed to support a design industry. And so that's pretty much the presentation. I've probably taken about 20 minutes of my time. Um, normally I have uh, 40 minutes or so of questions following it, but I don't think I'm going to have that. <laughs> questions? Can you go back a slide? Sure. Um, all right. I, I'm a, is this on? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a Cleveland State student, okay, and I would really like to know, because Cleveland State's about three blocks from there, mm -hmm. how you're going to make Cleveland State pretty, because that is the ugliest set of buildings I've ever seen. It is. Um, the, one of the reasons why uh, Cleveland State was so interested in this project is that they do see it beautifying the campus. Um, the, uh, there are plans for the Fine Arts Building, which would be facing Euclid. Um, uh, Ned Hill, who I'm working with at Cleveland State, often uh, refers to that stretch as the uh, the best collection of Stalinist architecture in the in the region. Uh, there really is uh, uh, they're very serious about changing that, and they realize that it's a uh, it's an issue. And that and again, that's why they were so interested in this. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm from Detroit. I was, uh, I was driving down to Home Depot the other day. I turned on the Cleveland Public Radio and caught this thing about the Cleveland Plus Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk very briefly about that? Because I have a follow-on question, but I, I'm a little fuzzy on what exactly. How, how does Cleveland Plus relate to this design initiative you're talking about? Um, honestly, uh, the Cleveland Plus Initiative, I think it was announced maybe two or three days ago. Mm -hmm. I'm, pretty, uh, I'm pretty new to that. Uh, you know, that concept is pretty new to me. 
Um, that, that's an initiative that's through the Greater Cleveland Partnership and, um, and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Th there are a lot of different um, organizations within the Greater Cleveland Partnership. The, the partnership is one of the organizations that we're working with to make this project happen. So that's a, that's a much higher level sort of branding uh, identity uh, project for the city and the region. Um, this is sort of a subset of it, uh, but th they have a lot going on there. Um, there. One project is the Medical Mart that's going on. This is a project that's going on, Convention Center project that's going on. So these are all subsets of a larger strategy to kind of rebrand, create a new identity for the region. Okay, well that's, that's my next question is there, there is a lot going on and at what point is the, um, the energy spreading itself too thin where, okay, we're trying to call Cleveland, uh, you know, a, a new center of design. If, if, if mm -hmm. you know, when, when people say Milan, you don't think of Milan for, for their cappuccino or anything. You think of them for their design period. Right. Um, can Cleveland at, at simultaneously be, be the Milan and the Paris and the London and the <laughs> Berlin and the, and the Adelaide and the, you know, and, and the Tokyo? We, when you've got so many disparate groups trying to say, okay, we're going, we're going to focus all of our energy on making Cleveland synonymous with uh, industrial innovation. Mm -hmm. um, at, at what point do all these initiatives, is, is, there, is there an overall planning, um, um, an overall plan uh, that, that would unite all these? Um, well, th this goes to the question of the overall vision. Um, it, it, honestly, I think one of the things in this city is that um, a lot of people are tired of waiting for someone at a higher level to do something. Uh, and so a lot of people on a much lower level are trying to do things. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, it could be a patchwork, and it could be a really nice patchwork. Uh, you know, I go to, uh, you know, you can go to, Manhattan and neighborhoods differ dramatically from place to place. Uh, you know, is it the best use of energy and resources to pursue five different paths? No, but you know, people really want to do something, and I think they're tired of waiting. Well, sure, the, the shotgun technique has has a, a more chances of, of success, even if each of those chances isn't isn't as great. It's it's worthy. It, um, it is, and in fact, the the. Um, you know, again, the, the basis of this concept is, you know, we do this already. We just spread it out so, so thin over such a large area that it doesn't really have any identity. Okay, my, my final question is, um, what is it about the design program uh, at, at, uh, that you mentioned earlier that mints some of the most sought after talent? How did that happen in Cleveland? What was the magical ingredient in Cleveland that made that here? Well, uh, it's funny because we're, we're, in the, uh, we're in the period of uh, uh, students making decisions about what's uh, prospective students deciding where they're going to go. So I've gotten this, uh, you know, what's the difference between Cleveland and, and all these other schools and what makes it different and why did it end up there? Um, well, when, uh, I think it's a combination of things. One is we are an industrial hub, have been an industrial hub. Uh, design has been very important, and there was demand here, so this program grew. So the, the DNA has existed for 60 plus years. Uh, and and, and uh, when you've got, when you have something around that long, it's easy to maintain momentum. So, so that's one, we do have history on our side. Um, the next thing is that uh, the, the program is unique in that it's, it's uh, a lot of design programs might be part of an engineering program or an or a architecture program. Uh, this is part of an art school. There's a lot of energy there. Uh, CIA students are seen as, the design students are seen as very innovative, and it really is kind of the synergy with the, with the fine arts programs. Um, we have uh, the luxury of space. All, all the students have their own studio space that is in a larger, you know, they're, they're dedicated studio spaces where students work together. When I leave the classroom, uh, I may spend a half an hour one-on-one -on -one time with the student. They spend hours with each other. They teach each other new things. The, um, 
the, and the students that teach learn what they know, but even it reinforces what they learn. The, uh, the students on the re re receiving end, after I leave, the learning keeps going on. So it's a really dynamic environment. Um, and, you know, why Cleveland? Well, you know what? We had space. And so the, the studios are big and, and all the students have space. So, you know, that's an advantage. Um, the, uh, all our faculty are practicing designers. We don't have a whole lot of traditional academics. So we're all out there doing what we do, understanding how it works, and trying to do it at the leading edge. So um, I'm, we're lucky. I, I, I can't point to anything else. We have all the combinations of the right things. Was that another question? Um, I guess my question is, and I, I apologize if you've covered this already. I walked in a little late, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, I find this very fascinating, but I can't necessarily get involved from the top-down level. So what, how can I get involved from like the grassroots up level to, I guess, help the, the design district? What can I do as just a citizen of Cleveland? Well, um, it, it, it's uh, one thing that already happened after the announcements and uh, sort of progress began is uh, a lot of questions came up about, uh, you know, where should I, where should I locate my uh, you know, I want to build a, a web, commercial web business. Where should I put it? Well, you should put it here. Uh, I, I know that's not, uh, you know, it building a, uh, you know, looking for space for a hacker organization. This might be the place to do it. We're trying to create a, uh, a diverse, dynamic, creative environment that's sort of clustered where uh, things that are happening in one organization affect another. Uh, so that's, that's one thing, if, if you're looking for space or someone else is looking for space, look here. Um, another one is, um, the, uh, I, I've noticed that there are times when the momentum starts to slow. And it's, uh, it's everybody thinks it's a great idea, but then, uh, on the political level, but then they get distracted with something else. Well, uh, I think from a grassroots level, people need to start saying, where is it? What are you doing? Because I have to tell you, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I feel like I walked in with a golden goose and the city kicked it out. And they haven't. I'm exaggerating. But uh, sometimes there's a, a lack of a sense of urgency, and grassroots movements help maintain the sense of urgency. Um, it, you know, uh, it was probably uh, maybe... Four months ago, Rubbermaid announced they're moving to North Carolina. Uh, the, that's, our, that's, our, that's a core industry for this region that is, that is slowly going to dissipate if we don't recognize that it's important and invest in it and put the infrastructure in place that's going to build it. Other questions? Um, I might have missed this if you covered it, but um, is there like a phased rollout of this, or is it going to happen like overnight, or what's the time frame? Um, well, the, the state. Euclid Avenue going to look like that? Yeah, uh, the stage that we're in now, um, the because a, a, an important part of this is the clustering of activities. So the the uh, you know the market could drive what happens. So. Uh, if the market drives, w one person's going to be 10 blocks away from the other. And that's not clustering. That doesn't give you the dynamic that you want. So the, what we're working on now before we can sign companies up and start pounding nails is uh, we have to develop a master lease agreement where we identify a cluster of pro immediate properties for showrooms that make it the right kind of experience um, the, uh, once that master lease agreement's developed, we understand what incent incentives are available, then we can start to sit down and sign agreements with companies. So the phase that we're in now is that um, clustering the real estate. The, uh, the, the next phase would be signing up companies, and you know, we're looking at uh, hopefully five or six companies initially, and that really starts the momentum. Um, and, you know, we're hoping by the end of summer we're in that situation. And hopefully by the end of the year we're in construction. And the, the goal is that as the silver line is completed, as construction on Euclid ends, then this is sort of coming to life. 
Any other questions? I have one more, um, and this might throw the rails off the track a little bit, but uh, I'm more of a musical person. I get very into what I call the, the auditory arts, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of wondering what kind of crossover benefits might come out of uh, a fairly visual-oriented art and design district right. for the musical side of, of the arts, culture, in Cleveland. The, um, th there are seven or eight design districts in the U.S. Most of them are... Um, architecture, decorating, furniture. So uh, consumer product design was a differentiator. It's, it's, uh, it draws on existing assets. It's a clear differentiator from the, the Pittsburgh design district, which is its furnishings. Uh, so the, the idea of concentrating on visual and product design is just a differentiator. If, if this isn't uh, architecture, graphics, interior design, uh, furniture, art, studios, culinary, music. If it's not, if it's not a creative hub, it's not going to have the effect, the desired effect. Um, we're, um, and in fact, even in product design, the it's gone beyond the uh, the object, and it's the experience that people are interested in. And, and that's sound, and it's, uh, and it's visual, and it's tactile, and it's, it's a lot of things. So it needs to have all those inputs. I had a quick question. Yep. I'm not sure of the relevance of it, but do you feel that uh, Cleveland's geographical location may have a huge part in it? As far as it being between, like, uh, Chicago, between Akron, between New York, all the other different big cities? Um, I, there was a slide I had in here that, um, that I actually took out. Uh, there's, uh, if you drew a 300-mile radius around Cleveland, Cleveland at the center, there, uh, almost half of all the product design programs in the country are within that 300 miles, uh, and it, actually a couple in Canada as well. So the, you know, there's, it's, it's not a mistake that all of those product design programs are in that. It's where a lot of industry was. It was where it was a population center. So um, it, it, uh, it just, just as a starting point, there's an enormous amount of talent. Uh, it, when I go to Industrial Design Society conferences, about a third of all the attendees at the conferences, are, they either went to school in Ohio, they're from Ohio, um, they work in Ohio. It's, um, it, this should be the design state. I mean, we produce a third of all the designers in the country and we're, what, well, a small percentage of the population. So, um, so e even that, there, there's something, again, back to the DNA, there's something in the soil that's, uh, that's breeding designers. Uh, yep. Forgive me for using leverage as a verb, but at what level can you leverage that, um, the, the Clevelandness of the field? You know, when you're at a, an international conference or something like that, just throw in a couple of in jokes and, <laughs> and make you know make all those other people in the audience feel like, oh man, I should have been in Cleveland. <laughs> and, and, and and to to what level might you know things like that already play uh, a role in in those sorts of conferences and, and events like that already? Well, I'll tell you, when this was announced, uh, it, within days, it was, it was on the, the blogs for the IDSA, you know, all these design organization websites. Well, actually, I should say, I mean, it, it was within 24 hours. And then 24 hours after that, we were already getting the, the emails from alumni who, or, 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 or Ohioans who had moved away and said, you know, basically said, wow, this is a reason to come back. So the, uh, and, and there are a lot of people out there who are looking for a reason to come back, but they're in Boston, and Boston's cool, and there's a nightlife, and, you know, all these cool firms to work at, and they're, they're looking this way saying, well, when, when is that culture going to happen? Well, this gives them enough hope where when they start making the return trip, they're going to build that that same kind of environment. Um, the, uh, it, the, the funny thing about the Milan of the Midwest, that was, it, it, it was kind of a joke that I made three or four years ago, and, uh, and people didn't laugh. They came up and said, hey, how do we do that? Um, 
so, so in that sense, uh, you know, the, the, I, I was telling someone the other day that, um, that Boston refers to itself as the hub. And no one really knows why they refer to itself as the hub. Well, the reason why they do is um, Longfellow or someone wrote that Boston was the hub of the universe. Like, man. Well, people don't walk around there saying, hey, I live in the hub of the universe. I'm the best, you know, the universe revolves around me. But it's kind of an aspirational, you know, we want to be a center of culture and commerce. Um, you know, we need to start thinking of ourselves as that center of culture and commerce. And then, you know, we can say, hey, you ought to be here instead of there. Any other questions? Ponder, and I don't think people have thought about the bus lines very much. And the Silver Line uh, is not a panacea. Lord knows all you have to do is run a bus frequently and you have access. Yeah. And the one thing we found going around Cleveland is that they don't run buses at the off hours mm -hmm. where you could hope to have a nightlife, and they certainly don't run them frequently enough in the on hours or the off hours. And I hope we address that, not only the Silver Line, but also any of the lines that could bring you to the design district. It, it always amazed me that I could go to Paris and figure out when the bus or the train was coming or what the schedule was. It, 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 um, in, in just about any other major city, it's really easy to know. If I wait here for 10 or 15 minutes, a vehicle is going to show up that's going to take me here. Um, it, it's a problem. Uh, and I think uh, the RTA right now is struggling with ridership, not... Uh, and part of it is, I guess, bad signage, uh, not frequent enough. But the we try to buy weekly and, and monthly tickets, but it's a false economy if, in fact, uh, you can't use them often enough. And also, if you're downtown off hours, you're not only uh, wasting time, you're putting yourself at risk. Right. Uh, you're on public square, you wait for two hours, and even the cops aren't there, and they, you know, you're, you start talking crazy like the homeless are. <laughs> Until we have a, uh, a large population living downtown and, and through this area, the um, public transportation is going to be a, uh, you know, it's going to be one of those things they can write in the travel guide, have, has public transportation. So transportation actually has to come first before you get residency or board coffers. The, 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 the transportation must come before the resurgence of the population or well the there is transportation now you can drive and park anywhere <laughs> <laughs> exactly and we'll tear down a building if you're dissatisfied right <laughs> um, but but it, th these things do go hand in hand it's it's not going to run round the clock until there's someone there to use it round the clock and you know if you watch the the line that runs the to the lakefront boy every time I drive past that train it's empty it is awful. But I'll tell you what, I, I don't know how many times I've heard uh, family and friends say, it's really great, it's, I, it's uh, free one way, and you pay to come back, so I walked back. Boy, you showed them. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Will you come back next year and update us on the progress? Sure. I hope so other people will be here to. <laughs> there were all concerns about security this year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if, if that's all. Oh, I see a hand back. Oh, go ahead. What's the plan with the uh, design district? Um, is it strictly just building buildings? Um, or no, actually, the. Repopulating the, what we have? The. Or? the Ultimately, it's about thought leadership and design. It's the newest ideas come from here. Uh, the, the, these showrooms are, uh, you know, companies have to be a part of this. If you make the, uh, the sales function of a company more efficient, they listen. Now, ironically, uh, in a lot of cases, we've gone into companies saying, here's the plan. Um, this will make your sales function more efficient. And a, a, a number of 
presidents of companies have said, yeah, but this helps me attract better talent. I'm out in the middle of nowhere right now. If I have this, then I can attract better talent. So we went in focusing on we, what we thought was the low-hanging fruit, and actually a lot of companies have picked up that it, is, it really is about creating synergies uh, among companies and individuals and industries. Um, it's, it, it, it is about taking a leadership position in design and saying, you know, this is, a, this is an area where we're best at. Do you live downtown? Do I live downtown? Well? No. I live in an inner ring suburb. Okay. When I moved here, I actually, my wife and I, uh, uh, the, we looked downtown uh, at a lot of places and were surprised that the, we have two kids and, you know, trying to find a place that was big enough. Uh, and had the amenities that we wanted, it cost as much as it did in Boston. What were the amenities that you wanted? Um, uh, enough bathrooms, uh, windows that sealed, um, grocery store, things like that. And they, they were not downtown? Um, it, no, well, the, some of those things were, but the, price wa the prices were similar to they were then in Boston. And for not having much of a downtown life, uh, not really sure where to send kids to school, it, um, it wasn't a real appealing option. Are, are you near a park? What's that? A park with Am your kids? I? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Are there I live any, in Lakewood. I mean, are there any parks in downtown Cleveland? Open spaces? Um, <laughs> some pretty wind-blown ones. Uh, no, not kid friendly. I mean, I know the Ferrises are familiar with me hearing me say it, but I mean, we're called the Forest City. We have no forest in the city. No, we don't. It, the, it, you know, I'll throw out this is a tangent. Um, uh, it, you can shut down a third of all the streets in downtown Cleveland, and you won't <laughs> affect traffic at all. <laughs> yeah. So tear up a third of all the streets in downtown Cleveland and plant trees. Make them, and in fact, put grills and picnic tables and take a couple of those empty office buildings. Mm -hmm. And I, I ran the numbers. You could, you could build the... Uh, Are there clusters close enough to do that? Are there clusters there to do that? In downtown Cleveland? Yes. Sure, you could probably do it anywhere. Like I said, uh, tear up a third of all the streets and anywhere. Pick the, place. the highest rent is usually right up against those parks. Mm -hmm. Say like in New York with Central right. Park. Yeah. Um, Dan, we could do that if we were so dependent on parking, as you pointed out. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I don't even think that we, I don't think that anyone would even notice from a traffic and parking point of view if we did that. There is no traffic in Cleveland. I drive through right through town every single day from Lakewood to University Circle, and what people call traffic. Oh man, I miss the sense of urgency associated with traffic. There's something happening. There is no traffic here. We had traffic here in the 60s, and I left in the 70s. And then when we came back in the 80s, there was virtually no traffic. And then in the 90s, it got to be less. Right. Where you felt like walking into downtown, you were in the Rod Serling place. Yeah. That's right. It's really uh, accelerated. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, and when you notice it as one of the first things, it's, it's bad. Yeah. Go ahead. From a design standpoint, do you design um, beginning and then end of life product? You know, like each of us have a beginning and end. Sure. How about buildings? Do they have a beginning and end? Is, well, there, is there a vision to, I don't know, I'm just throwing out this idea to start a land reclamation product project? Maybe, I don't know, take a look at some of the buildings that we have existing. Not all of them, but I don't know, actuarially speaking, say, that at certain points we can retire them and reclaim. Sure. Maybe maybe some city in a design sense might be and would you agree that maybe one city might be ready to do something like that that doesn't have any traffic? Um, so uh, one um, I, I one of the things I was about to mention was I just just for fun I once took the um, the the price of an office building that had just been sold and, um, and looked at the cost of the building and cost of uh, build out and figured out that you could 
you could take one of these uh, 70s office buildings and turn it into 200,000 or 2,000 square foot homes that were about $200,000, and they just happened to be on the 20th floor of a building. And you could never get that in New York, San Francisco, Boston, Chicago, um, where if, if we really committed to it being a residential city, uh, we could have uh, offer something that no other city could offer in terms of what you got for the price that you paid in an urban area, and then start to you know, build the parks, build the transportation and infrastructure. I'll tell you, companies that are wanting to leave town will be making a round trip. Has Go. somebody uh, done a BTU study on what a tree's um, uh, potential energy source would be if it was converted to wood, and then take that nut on that value of that tree and flip it as an incentive toward, I don't know, say a vacant slum lord? Yeah. Uh, and say, if you knock down that building and you plant such and such trees, we will hang out this nut as yeah. an incentive? I, no, but The more I trees say, you plant, the more right. you get back for that building? I don't know if anyone's done that. I do know that E4S, Entrepreneurs for Sustainability, they've done things like they've, they've started to look at old homes as a natural resource in terms of disassembling, taking what, 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 are, what are, in effect, hardwoods, Trans, transforming them into new things. Um, so there are some things that have to do with reclamation and recycling that ha have been looked at. Anything else? At one time, um, Cleveland had a lot of landscape architects. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Lakeview Cemetery was mm -hmm. designed by one, Riverside Cemetery, the park that was by the old municipal stadium. Mm -hmm. Does the CIA have any kind of program for landscape architects? Or we don't, no. do we, I mean, I just think that if there is a history of that here, mm -hmm. it would be kind of a, and we were talking about designing parks again. It seems like a kind of a thing that might be interesting to somebody. It, it's, uh, I remember a few years ago, Steve Litt from the Plain Dealer wrote an article that uh, this was before Kent located their urban design center in Cleveland, that Cleveland was the largest major city without an architecture program. It took taking the program from Kent and moving it up here to do that. Um, the, I don't know if CIA is the right school to create a landscape architecture program, but uh, not only do we need an architecture program, but I think you're right, we do need, I, I mean, the, the, the metro parks, you know, that, that's a, it's a model of landscape architecture and, you know, public spaces. My daughter is a runner, and she, she goes to a lot of different cities and runs in their park systems, mm -hmm. and she feels that Cleveland does not, in this region, we really do not promote that to young people. No, as, we don't. As a lifestyle uh, option. Because no. she says it's by far the best in the country as far as how far you could run, how far you can bike without mm -hmm. ever seeing, you know, cross tra a lot of traffic. I started my morning this morning at 8.30 in Rocky River Reservation, so. Ashley, I, I want to talk to Gloria. Hi. <laughs> but we were, we were uh, driving around the other day and just rubbernecking and saying, you know, this is not a bad town. All it needs are a few, a few landscape architects and a lot of gardeners. Mm -hmm. And actually, one thing you can do right now is you can start with a lot of gardeners just taking care of what you got and doing some plantings. Uh, and this is the city that had beautiful sycamores on the public square and took them down. What are those bushes we have out there? Can anybody tell me what the bushes are? <laughs> Are they I thought bushes? those were telephone poles. I, no, they're, they're, they, they're, they should be blooming in a week or two. Yeah. But, but anyway, I just wanted to talk to Gloria, so we're, we're giving this guy a workout here. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I'm glad the crowd grew a little bit. Oh, okay, good. Thank you.
Yep, this is. Uh, so this before is. Before I had a moon landing the other day with a moon cart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, no, that no, that's 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 now. That's the way it is now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this this is my I I. Foreshadow or present shot. I I I've I've finally concluded that uh, you know if if we can put a man on the moon, we can fix Cleveland. Yeah, that's right. Can we really put a man on the moon? Yeah, but and even even if we didn't, we could make Cleveland so appealing, uh, even if it's fictional, that people will buy in. <laughs> Thank you.